my Brian, he sails on the sea. Where the wind blows so wild and so free, he follows the fish wherever they roam. Ten months in the year, he's never at home. No washing upon sailing day. For if you do that, you may wash him away. You know that's not really true. But still you don't do it in case you should rule. Catch me and eat me, but don't burn my bone. Think on this saying when he's on the phone. You're dreading that knock on the mission man. One look on his face tells you your Fleetwood has always been about the sea and about ships. Sailing ships, cargo boats, passenger vessels, fishing trawlers. They've all sailed in and out of the River Wire on the shores of Morecambe Bay. But it was the trawling trade that made Fleetwood's name and created a unique community in the town. In 1986, when Fleetwood has been celebrating its 150th birthday, the fishing industry still has a vital role to play in the life of Fleetwood. But there's no doubt things have changed. These boats behind me are all that remain of a once mighty deep sea fishing industry. But thanks to the whole movie makers who took their cameras to sea years ago, we can take a look back to the days of Fleetwood's fishing heyday. didn't get a lot of sleep <laughs> and uh, we used to wish for bad weather, a gale of wind so we could pull the gear aboard, lash it up and uh, get into the forecastle and get your head down and not worry about nothing for 12 hours because you knew that uh, the ship had been just dodging. That was skipper Jack Kelly who took some of this film looking back to the 30s when he was an apprentice in the old steam trawlers. Living conditions were primitive, with damp and verminous cabins where clothes went green with mould. The crew slept in their clothes and there wasn't enough fresh water for a regular wash. Facilities for washing at all, and uh, the, uh, they didn't come in until the, after the war in the 60s, and the new ships started coming along. And then we had, uh, of course, we had uh, proper bathrooms with showers and that. A channel full of trawlers was a common sight in the River Wire, but after only two or three days ashore, it was time for another two or three weeks at sea. A stout jersey, a plaid muffler, and heavy woolen trousers called Fianorts were the fishermen's working uniform. And as the ship sailed north to the fishing grounds, the mate, bosun, and deckhands got the trawl ready for action. Filling the wooden needles with twine was a job reserved for the trainee fishermen, the brassy. The name goes back to Skipper Kelly's early days when apprentices wore a uniform ashore complete with brass buttons and at sea they spent long hours polishing the brasswork. 
when it was time to start fishing, the mate tied a special knot in the cod end, which would release the catch when the nets were brought back on board. Robertsons of Fleetwood have been building winches for ships all over the world for many years. Plenty of steel warp was needed to tow the trawl in the deep water grounds around St Kilda and out at Muckle Flugger. These were areas where the Fleetwood fishermen searched for hake, a variety of fish for which the port was famous. When the marks on the warp showed that all was correct on the seabed far below, the trawler could tow the net over the fishing ground. It threw a terrific strain on the steel warps and brought the very real risk of injury to the men working on deck if one of the wires snapped. Out on the lonely ocean, the fishermen had only the gulls for company, and it's a mystery of nature that they appear in flocks from an empty sky as soon as there's the prospect of food on offer. Surrounded by the wonders of nature, the fishermen saw the sea and the weather in all its moods. They might be mending nets one sunny afternoon, and the next day, facing conditions altogether different. More incidents at sea than there is down the coal mine. Yeah. yeah. Of course the fishermen, as they say, have had a mine have been having the worst job, but there's no worse job in the world than a fisherman's job. Mm. No more dangerous job. Mm. There's more lives lost in the fishing industry, mm. because it never gets published. Mm. If a ship's lost with all hands, you do get a little publication, and then it's all forgotten. Far for the fisherman's wife, who got to live with it. But it's never been uh, a big ballyhoo like if there's three miners killed down the colliery. When the tow along the seabed was over, it was time to haul the gear back on board. Once again it was a dangerous business for the unwary and many accidents happened over the years. The giant trawl doors forced the mouth of the net open as it moved over the seabed, trapping the fish feeding near the bottom. Only now would the fishermen know if their labours had been successful. If the haul was a good one, the cod end bag would come bursting up out of the sea, buoyant with fish. For it was from the cod end that Fleetwood's fortunes came. Night and day, fair weather or foul, fishing went on round the clock, for 10 or 12 days. It was punishing work and no one could forecast the rewards. The value of the catch depended on the options back at home and a fisherman could return to Fleetwood after three weeks at sea owing the company money. He could have debts, perhaps for sea gear from the company store. His wife had drawn a weekly wage while he was away and if the demand for his fish on the market was poor his share of the proceeds might not be enough to cover what he owed. The fish he had worked so hard to bring home might end up as fish meal. The pay was pitiful, mm. and it's always been pitiful for a deckhands, for mm. deckhands and that. I mean, the skippers and mates, they did get a bit more higher pay on, mm. on shares, you see. Mm. But Considering the time they put in at sea, mm. I mean you were sea 24 hours a day, mm. you were hauling probably six, seven times a day, sometimes when the fishing was uh, thick, you know, when fish 
fish was thick, you'd, you'd be as much as uh, seven or eight holes, short holes in a day. Mm. And many a time you were up on the deck 24, 36 hours, perhaps 48 hours sometimes. Mm. And uh, when you realise the hours you put in, and at the end of the trip, what you were picking up, mm. nobody would do it in this world. Mm. Uh, today, anyhow, they wouldn't even dream of doing it. No. Livers taken from the fish were stored in special tanks. Back in Fleetwood, they were collected from each ship by the barge Sea Maid and taken to Spencer's factory, where they were turned into health-giving oil. A trawler is a sea-going slaughterhouse, for the fish must be gutted and cleaned to stop it rotting in the ice-filled hold. Before the fish can be stowed away below decks, it must be washed. More hard and dirty work for the deck crew. Later, automatic machines made the job a bit easier. Sometimes trawlers worked together on the fishing grounds. And wherever they went, the gulls went too. Riding the air waves as effortlessly as they lived on the sea's waves, they followed the ships across the wild water. They were only too eager to help clear up the debris that was left over from the fishing operations. In the ship's wake, a great raft of birds sat down to a right royal feast. When it was over, most of them disappeared, to return as if by magic, when the winch sprang into life again to signal the start of another haul. Once a source of food, to the inhabitants of the remote Scottish islands, the screaming gulls reap their own harvest of the sea. And the gannets, always anxious for the lion's share, went in like dive bombers. It's very dangerous and uh, you've always got to be wary of it, that's it. I've always found that. You do take chances, all fishermen take chances for fishing because you have to do. You have to get a trip. Once the ship left the dock, the men, they told you, the ship's all yours. You do what you like, you take it where you want, but you must come back with a voyage of fish. And whatever the weather is, don't come in the office and say to me, well, the weather's bad and there's a ship alongside you who's in the dock and he's just landed 400 boxes and you've come in with 120. <laughs> so it was no good you saying, no, the weather's been bad or uh, we... Uh, the gear was foul or something like that. The responsibility was all yours. When the fishing gear got damaged by rocks on the seabed, the deck crew needed a variety of abilities to sort the problems out. Many men who were later to join the dole queue, described as unskilled casual labourers, in fact had a great deal of skill in their hands. When the steel trawl warp snapped under the strain, it had to be spliced back together again as soon as possible. The lull in fishing operations gave the engine room brigade time for some maintenance work. There were two engineers and two assistants, the greasers, all part of the team of around 18 men who manned each trawler. 
And the brassy had to work overtime, filling needles, when the shattered trawl had to be repaired in double quick time. Without the net in the water, the ship and the crew were earning nothing at all. they shared. Looking back on their days in the trawling trade, many men speak of the friendship they knew as the best part of that unique way of life. up alongside the old fish market where the dockers known locally as lumpers worked through the night to unload the catch everything had to be ready for the auctions to start at eight o'clock in the morning many of the port's wholesale fish merchants who bought the fish processed it on the market where winter conditions resemble the deck of an arctic trawler sometimes the fish were stiff with frost and the entire water supply of the market was frozen solid. Only a mug of hot tea and a bacon butty from the legendary Dock Cafe made life bearable. Many of the present day fleet have been bought from other ports. Few have the registration letters FD for Fleetwood these days. But they still need nets and ice and other supplies. fish arrives in Fleetwood by road from other ports as well as by sea to help keep the fish processing firms in operation and the filleters at work in the relative comfort of the new fish market buildings. But the old hands will tell you that now everyone works inside their own separate unit something has been lost from the old days when the market swarmed with people and there was always a fresh face to share a joke with. fishing has often been a battle for survival. But although Fleetwood's staple industry has taken some very hard knocks, there are signs of hope, signs of investment in the future. An example is the Royalist. This old Fleetwood trawler was rotting at the quayside. She seemed destined for the scrapyard, but now she's back at sea with a new lease of life and a fresh coat of paint. Fleetwood's Jubilee Quay was once the home of sailing smacks and prawning boats. And those who believe that Fleetwood has a big future in tourism, reckon that the Jubilee could one day rival San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf. <laughs> Dawn over the docks still reveals a busy scene, but fish and men are a lot thinner on the ground these days.
charioteers of the fish stage are still keeping their auto trucks on the move. There's icemen and lumpers and An army of workers operated onshore to keep the fleet at sea. Some of their trades are still active in the port today. But the decline of the industry had a spin-off effect on many firms and businesses in the town. The riggers had plenty of work to do on board any trawler, and they produced a wide variety of equipment needed for fishing. Braiding was traditionally a job for the ladies. While many worked in the braiding rooms, countless others did the same job at home. The sections of net they made were turned into complete trawls by the net fixers, or sent on board the ships as spare parts for use in repairs when the trawls got damaged. And the basket maker was a vital part of the scene. His products are all made of plastic now, Many Fleetwood trawlers were built at the yard of Cook, Welton and Gemmell at Beverley, just outside Hull. This is the Princess Elizabeth, under construction nearly 40 years ago. She belonged to the Boston Company, a firm which played a big part in Fleetwood's fishing story. Launched sideways into the narrow river, ships like this replaced the old coal burners and offered a big improvement in living conditions. The fine lines of these ships meant they could survive terrible weather conditions, although Fleetwood needs no reminder of the fact that many men and ships didn't make it back home. Sons followed fathers into the fishing industry, and many families involved in the trade were related. On board ship, everyone had their job to do, and a good cook was a vital part of the team. Fish was on the menu for breakfast at 6am, and for the evening meal 12 hours later. At noon, there'd be soup and a roast and boiled pudding called duff. In between all this work, the cook baked his own bread. And if he was a skillful caterer, he boosted the morale of everyone on board. Even when the weather was bad, it still had to be meals as usual. Sometimes it was like cooking on board a roller coaster. But the maximum pressure fell on the skipper. Not only was he responsible in law for the safety of his crew and his ship, but somehow he had to find a catch of fish and bring it back to Fleetwood. put in bad weather, you had to fish when everybody else fished, even though it was blowing force 10. Sometimes it was well, blowing force 10 when we've been fishing up at, in Flugger after the Hague. Uh, you had to be uh, a soft kind of skipper or anything like that, you had to be a strict disciplinary because uh, if you didn't, well it was, uh, you was out on your neck. No washing upon sailing day For if you do that 
you may wash him away. This gull hasn't hitched a ride on a trawler. He's an unwilling passenger. Sometimes the greedy birds got trapped in the net and proved quite a handful for their kind-hearted rescuers. grounds, the Fleetwood men saw some of the finest scenery in Britain among the highlands and the islands. Navigating the narrow sounds with their many hazards could be tricky. And sometimes the ships called in at a friendly Scottish port. Catch me and eat me, but don't burn my bones. Think on this saying when he's on the phone. You're dreading that knock off the mission man. One look on his face tells you your mind. You who gripe on the price of your fish Think you are the man who still... The coast of Scotland never looked better than when the ship was steaming south on her way home and the tired watchkeepers could look forward to a little rest and recreation. After their skipper had completed his final checks it wasn't long before the ship was steaming across Morecambe Bay on the last lap of the journey. Often, ships like the Wire Corsair here had to wait at anchor for a while off wire light before they could sail into dock for a well-earned break ashore. Some of the landmarks they passed, including the power station, and the old lifeboat house have been scrapped and many fine ships have gone to the breaker's yard like the legendary Lord Middleton which inspired this song She's obsolete Iron out of date To be broken up now She must Just a kindly old glance If ever you're a-passing a by Over there in the old scrapyard Lord Middleton must die For thirty years now she caught the fish Drummed on the Arctic seas She fought with the winds And the terrible ice As she struggled to become free Never again will that trawler come in Or seagulls over her fly Through snow, she never paused. 
to digress She dodged those steel torpedoes She heard shells whistle by Over there in the old scrapyard Lord Middleton Then came a swing to heavy fishing at Iceland, which proved lucrative at first. Problems came when Iceland began to extend her territorial waters to include the major grounds. So came the Cod War confrontations, when Icelandic spotter planes plotted the position of the ships, and Coast Guard gunboats harassed them and cut away their fishing gear. But apart from the gunboats, weather conditions at Iceland could be truly horrific. And as they swung up to the moon, God just feel her pound, swore that she would break in two, sink in the Arctic ground, in that hellish Arctic ground, you freeze before you drown. No, me boy, don't ever go to the hellish Arctic ground. The mass made circles round the stars all covered with the spray. Now if there is a God above, what save us now we pray. The wind had gone clean off the scales, roaring like a hound. Saw the mizzen torn away, lost in the Arctic ground, in that hellish Arctic ground. You freeze before you drown. No, me boy, don't ever go to the hellish Arctic ground. Oh, at last a Fleetwood Town landed in the dock. Saw the owner come on board, he asked what fish we got. Lord, you should have seen his face fall when it was found that we had caught just now to tall from the hellish Arctic ground in that hellish Arctic ground you freeze before you drown no me boy don't ever go to the hellish Arctic ground After the loss of three hull trawlers with only one survivor, the support ship Miranda was sent north by the government to provide medical and technical services to the fleet. The Fleetwood skippers favoured the west coast grounds. Ships from many ports and many nations fished at Iceland, but when the limit went to 200 miles from 50 miles, Britain pulled out and the nation's deep sea fishing industry was dealt a body blow. She drove her bow's feet under, saw her take it green. Staggered as that old grey beard smashed through the wheelhouse screen. The helmsman knocked down to the ground, wheel went spinning round. We were lying on our beam ends, out in the Arctic ground. In that hellish Arctic ground, you freeze before you drown. No, me boy, don't ever go to the hellish Arctic ground. 
Load away by group again, flooded down below. Half a girl lost overboard, wondered when she'd go. And as they swung up to the moon, God just feel her pound. Here's a seagoing transfer deal in progress. Maybe they'd run out of tea, without which no trawler could function. The provident waters around Iceland had yielded a rich harvest for Britain. So when the grounds were closed, the men of Fleetwood, Grimsby and Hull found it much harder to survive. Only one traditional side fishing distant water trawler remains operational now. She's the Arctic Corsair of Hull, very similar in design to this ship. But a revolution had occurred in the design of trawlers. The arrival of the stern fishers. The Lancashire port had a fine fleet of these ships. The largest of them, Priscilla, froze her catch at sea. This produced blocks of frozen whole fish and they could be stored on shore for processing when needed. The other stern trawlers at Fleetwood used the traditional method of storage. They loaded up with tons of ice before each voyage and packed the fish in this to preserve it. The new ships sometimes ranged far into the icy northern latitudes in search of a catch working off the coast of Russia and Norway. Some of these ships are still operating on the east coast, but occasionally they visit Fleetwood when the rock all season gets underway each year. The new breed of trawler proved to be an efficient machine for catching fish. The trawl came and went over the stern ramp making deck conditions safer for the crew. And the catch was processed under cover in a factory area below decks instead of out in the open air. Living conditions improved too. Even in the modern diesel ships, eight men often share a cabin. Apart from a bunk and a clothes locker, they had little off-duty space. But some of the stern trawlers had individual cabins and recreation areas. History doesn't record what the whale thought about it all, but these youngsters seem to be enjoying their pleasure trip, the traditional way that generations of Fleetwood lads have sampled life on a trawler. While the politicians argued about common market fishing rules, Fleetwood owners recruited Frenchmen 
for the expertise they had gained on traditional grounds around the British Isles. And the stern trawlers from Fleetwood were also sent off on another important mission. They went to search for great shoals of mackerel and herrings that could be sold to Eastern Bloc countries. as far apart as Falmouth and Ullapool, trawlers like this rendezvoused with the Russian factory ships, which tinned or froze the fish on board. But as Fleetwood's fishing fortunes declined, trawlers were sold or transferred to other ports or other duties. your fishermen struggling to stay in business alone. But Fleetwood's no ghost town. When the port's 150th birthday came around this year, the entire community rolled back the carpet for a mammoth celebration. The Transport Festival has already become a major tourist attraction in the North West. And interest is growing in Fleetwood's maritime past. The heyday of the deep sea trawlers was part of that proud heritage. 